Hi, everybody. I'm Jeffrey Phillips. I'm associate pastor of Winnetka Congregational Church and a member of our church's green team. And we're so glad that you've joined us this evening. We will be led tonight uh, a little bit by myself, but mostly by the co-chairs of our church's green team. And they are Liz Kunkel and Steve Hules, and you'll meet them in a moment. Joining us tonight are people from the Go Green teams of Kenilworth Union Church, Winnetka Congregational Church, and the Go Green teams of Go Green Winnetka, Go Green Kenilworth, the wonderful League of Women Voters of Winnetka, Northfield, and Kenilworth, and people from the Women's Exchange. And there might be some other groups that I'm not aware of tonight, but we're certain, certainly glad that you are part of our circle this evening. There might be a time when Steve will unmute you if he thinks that a comment or question that you need to express would be better done by you orally, but otherwise do, do try to rely on comments uh, through our chat function tonight. This session is being recorded, including the chat, and the video and audio recording will be available through the Winnetka Congregational Church YouTube channel sometime before December. <laughs> sometime in the next seven days, I promise you. And again, Liz Kunkel is our principal uh, facilitator tonight, and I would like to turn it over to her. Liz. Thanks, Thanks Jeffrey. Thank you everyone for joining us. We are so excited to have you tonight. Um, we, uh, we're honestly, like Jeffrey said, we're so grateful to have so many people interested in this topic. Um, as Jeffrey also said, I'm Liz Kunkel. I'm a member of the Winnetka Congregational Church Green Team, um, our third uh, uh, Green Team, uh, Church Green Team member uh, tonight is Steve Hewels. Um, I am also the founder and president of Go Green Winnetka, which is one of a, a, a network of Go Green uh, citizen organizations in our uh, environmental organizations in our in our area. Um, I'm also an environmental and forestry commissioner in Winnetka, and I'm also an employee of a uh, compost company, uh, woman-based. Evanston based compost company. Um, so uh, I come at sustainability from the waste recycling and compost side of things. So this program tonight really became sort of part of a follow up uh, to a couple other programs we had done previously, starting about a year ago, a little over a year ago, November of 2019, um, a, a similar uh, um, combination of groups, faith houses, uh, Citizen Go Green groups and the League of Women Voters uh, uh, hosted an, an in-person movie screening of the movie, The Story of Stuff, which is a 20 minute uh, video regarding uh, some of the foundation that's that's then followed up on in this uh, story of plastic movie that we're uh, talking about more specifically tonight. But at the same time, we discussed the story of Stuff, the movie, which was released uh, uh, in 2007, um, a reading group that some of us are a part of also discussed a, the book called The Story of Stuff, which was published a few years later in 2010. And um, I was really surprised at how in-depth that book was. It was quite dense and quite really informative, but I was equally surprised at what a page turner it was. And so I highly recommend The Story of Stuff if you haven't read it already. Um, it's just, it lays out the whole foundation um, for this, uh, uh, for what this specific plastics part of the discussion tonight. And then back in November, 2020, just a few months ago, we did screen this movie, The Story of Plastic. Um, it, there were a couple people who had some technical issues and things like that. And obviously just people have inherent conflicts. And we decided the issue was timely and urgent and important enough that it was worth having another discussion, which is what we're doing tonight. Wanted to give people another opportunity to see the movie, The Story of Plastic. Um, and for those of you who haven't seen it yet, thank you for joining us anyway. We, we do, please don't ever feel like you shouldn't join a conversation of ours if you haven't read a book or watched the movie. We welcome you and your presence and your input any, uh, all the time, <laughs> not just anyway, all the time. But um, I wanted to mention, we thought the movie link 
uh, the screening link was only going to be available through this evening, through the end of our presentation, which is the standard format for, for these movies. But the um, producers told us that it's actually available through March 1st. So if you haven't watched it or you know somebody else who's interested and didn't get a chance to watch it or you want to watch it again, please feel free to do so. That, that opportunity exists through the end of the month. So um, uh, as Jeffrey said, we have more than 140 people registered and we're very excited you're with us. Um, uh, he also mentioned some of the housekeeping issues that the program will be recorded. It will be uploaded uh, eventually, but in relatively short order to the Winneka Congregational Church YouTube channel. Um, everybody uh, should be muted when they join and we request that you please stay muted because we do expect to be a very large group tonight. Um, so that we can uh, facilitate the discussion and minimize any background noise and distractions for people. And if you find yourself muted when you think you didn't intend to be, please stay that way. <laughs> um, uh, because again, due to the size of the audience, we will we, we are keeping everybody on screen. We didn't want to make it a presentation and panelist type of discussion, um, but it will obviously be hard for us to see everybody on screen. So if you would like to make a comment or ask a question, please do so in the chat. It will be hard for us to see if you physically try to raise your hand in your screen uh, because there are so many screens to view. So please utilize the chat feature if you can. We are, uh, we wanted to start, I will, uh, Jeffrey, I'm ready to share my screen, I guess. We'll pull up, we have a PowerPoint presentation to, uh, obviously the foundation for tonight's event is this movie, The Story of Plastic. Uh, we, we, we feel like this, the movie did a wonderful job of laying out the issues of plastic production, uh, pro, uh, uh, pollution, um, but different issues along the way. Um, and the question is sort of, you know, what's next, what now? Um, our first, um, the agenda tonight is we want to start with some sort of general impressions of the film. We'll open that up to, to everybody who's here to, to offer their impressions of the film. And then we'll move to some general discussion questions um, and, and end with some calls to action uh, for everybody to consider as takeaways from this event and the movie. General impressions, comments about the film. Again, we open this up to, to, to everybody. This is the discussion part of the event. What are your general impressions of the film? What, what did you enjoy it? Was, did it give new information? Were you skeptical about it? What did you like? What did you not like about it? We welcome any and all comments. And again, you don't have to type your comments, full comment. You can just say, I wanna make a comment now. I'll uh, call you in and invite you to participate. Somebody in typed into the chat room that it was overwhelming and that it was hard to watch. I agree. Depressing. That seems like a good description, but the information, it's information that we need to hear. Super informative. So Mary typed, uh, it's hard to imagine how we can change the convenience culture that we live in. Carolyn noted in Guys can probably follow along with your, your chats. It seems like it's a losing battle. Well, we hope to, we hope to rally together tonight to uh, offer some other ideas. I'm not willing to throw in the, the plastic bottle yet. All right, so uh, Jen mentioned that contained very important information, then it shed new light on how fossil fuel industry is still impacting plastic use for profit. How true. Janice, you wanted to speak. Why don't you go ahead and come off mute and offer your comment? Hi, I was, um, I'm from West Chicago. I'm on the uh, League of Women's Voters in Wheaton. And I'm on the environmental committee uh, here. And um, watching this movie and seeing how fast we deteriorated with all this garbage in such a short amount of time it just seems like it's almost an impossibility to correct. Mm -hmm. You know, I you know, I know what I can do. I know it's one person at a time, but it seems like to correct this over the whole world just seems yeah. impossible to do. Isn't it crazy? It, how daunting that seems. Yep. We're gonna, we're gonna talk some more about that as we move through the discussion tonight. Others wanna come offline and offer your opinions? 
Beth offered how maddening it, uh, it maddening to learn about how the industry had tried to shift responsibility entirely to, to the consumer's shoulders. Janice, uh, I like that it focused on the source of the problem, the petroleum industry. Yeah. Take out COVID has certainly made it harder. Yes, it's certainly, certainly around my house, it seems like it's gotten much worse. Uh, Sarah mentioned that it was hard to watch and that we wish there was more at the end for suggestions going forward. Well, that's part of why we're together tonight to talk specifically about that. Uh, how do you buy, how do we buy blueberries without using plastic, Mary offered? Great question. Uh, Liz, we're uh, coming up on 7.15. What Perfect. I'm going to suggest is that, again, since the chat will be part of our archive, some people will get the chance to read through others' general impressions. But before we go, I want to do one more call if anybody would like to offer a suggestion verbal or a comment or a reaction or even a question verbally, now's a good time to do so. All right, Liz, I think the comments are still coming in, but um, why don't we go ahead and move on to the questions? Will do. All right. Discussion question number one, as, as was touched on a little bit in the general impressions, corporations such as across the board, oil and gas, food, beverage, packaging, consumer goods retails, retail have been pushing the pro-plastic narrative for decades. Why do you think the media has focused on where plastics end up, the pollution piece of it, rather than where the plastics come from in the first place and why they're created in the first place? Any thoughts on that? Why has the focus always been on the end of this process? So again, if you wanna comment on that, just essentially raise your hand by uh, noting in the chat that you'd like to comment. The movie made it pretty clear, I thought, that uh, the corporations have been driving the narrative. And since they're the ones uh, making the news, so to speak, that's the news that gets reported. It makes for dramatic video, right? If you're um, in the news business, what, if it bleeds, it leads? Well, the, you think about some of the pollution pictures that uh, that sometimes become a focus of, of the media dis, uh, coverage. Yeah, hi, this is, this is Vipka. I don't know if, if, <laughs> if that's me you're calling on. I participated yes. in the webinar and the Zoom call by the Shed today together with the Conservation Foundation. And it seemed to me from what they were saying that there is a historical background for that too in that I think the plastic producing companies when plastic became convenient and, and cheaply to produce and uh, the next great best thing, it, it seemed at some point in time they were considering there was going to be a problem, but they heavily um, focused or the plastic producers heavily focused on recycling and essentially sold that as the magic solution. And I don't know if that was in the 1960s or 1970s, but it seemed that there is a kind of like historical reason playing into this as well. Yeah, Liz will speak a little bit more about that. In fact, Liz, you might want to add, uh, add something to it now. But um, yes, that's a recurring issue with the oil companies, as well as the large packaging uh, packagers like Coca-Cola and Pepsi and Nestle's. Right. It, it is. It, I think, um, thank you for asking the, the question. I think uh, I recalled from the, the timeline, I think one of the great just features of the movie was how it identified with that visual timeline when certain things happened. And I think it was sort of 1975 uh, in the wake of the first Earth Day a few years prior when there was increased heightened awareness of environmental damage and threats. And it, and, and it was the packaging and beverage and, and other uh, petrochemical uh, producers who were like, recycling. <laughs> That's what you need. That'll take care of all of it. And it was like this like bright, shiny object that we're like, oh, recycling, recycling. Um, and I will, I'll throw in a little personal thing. As I mentioned, I, I came, I come at sustainability entirely from the wayside. I've been a lifelong recycler and I do think it's important. I just think it's not the panacea and it's created a lot of complications, but I think it's an important part of the cycle. But so when I read the story of plastic, the book for our discussion a year ago, I was so 
upset and I felt like such a rube. I felt like I'd been taken advantage of that I've been promoting events around America Recycles Day for years only to find out that it's that Keep America Beautiful is, is an organization that consists of exactly these packaging, beverage, food, petrochemical based manufacturers that all along were putting the emphasis on us as consumers and individuals and municipalities, taxpayers, and deflecting from themselves. And I've been angry about it ever since. So that's my two cents. Anyone else uh, want to raise a uh, comment? I can read some of the chats, but uh, please feel free to offer them to the group. Thank you. And I'll throw out the second question. Obviously, there are multi-part questions here. I, I One of the other big takeaways for me was this assertion that plastics, the demand, that the, uh, the issue with plastics is driven by supply, not demand. Again, it, it jibes with, with what the movie's been saying, that the corporations drive the narrative. But I, I think it was helpful to hear it in, the, in those terms and would appreciate hearing other people's perspectives on that. Beth, do you wanna, you had a comment? Sure. Um, I'm sure you may have heard that General Motors is phasing out all gas powered engines between be, before 2035. The oil industry is in a total panic. They know that their market is absolutely drying up and the, the plastic industry is how they are, they're focused on that to keep, keep their profits up. And there are huge numbers of plastic facilities that are being proposed. And one of the things that we can do is to just try to fight those one after another um, to prevent more plastic uh, manufacturing facilities from being uh, built. Thanks, Beth. Mary commented that she had heard a report on NPR some time ago that plastics was preferable to glass for packaging because of weight, um, more costly to ship heavier loads. And I think that's, that's a fact, right? In terms of one cost. I think the message that the movie was also trying to make though was there, you have to look at the full life cycle costs of these product or these, um, packaging choices that we're making. And when you're able to externalize the waste portion of the plastic, there's an incentive for the grocery stores to prefer them, the bottling companies to prefer them, and the, of course the, the uh, petroleum companies to prefer those things because the, co the waste costs are borne by others. And, and the cost is less to begin with, maybe less to begin with. I remember, do people remember a few years ago when I felt like when you had to get, you have to get plastic water bottles when we traveled, uh, travel through airports, that it was a few years ago that the plastic in those bottles became noticeably thinner, right? It crinkles more and, and they use less of it and it's lighter weight because it's cheaper for them, but it may not be, it may also be less recyclable. I mean, just in general, that was, and as Steve said, it's an externality that hasn't been historically taken into account. And hopefully to me, that's the, that's the thing that can and will change to make the systemic difference. So we, we it's not, it, it, it can't be all on us. We know that it, and we have to resist the suggestion, the uh, implication that it is, that's been coming at us for 40, 50 years and just say no. Marjorie raises a comment through a question, or a question really, and, and I, um, would returning two paper bags only destroy more trees, question mark. Is paper a viable alternative? Do you have a comment on that, Liz? My, my comment is that while it does, there's definitely the, the downside, not just of the resources used to cut down a tree and potentially the carbon that's released into the air by cutting down that tree. But at base, the trees are renewable resource in a way that the petroleum oil-based is not. Literally it's not, there's a finite amount of the crude oil in our world. Whether we think there's a lot or a little, it's a finite amount in there. We can always plant more trees. It is a, renew a renewable resource. And to me, therefore it's, it's, a, it's a totally different category. And Terry offers too that, well, what about reusable bags, right? 
refuse, right, or, right. reduce, reuse, right. reuse. And recycle. Right. And, 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 and beyond, like a lot of us have thought about reusable bags for a long time. Logistically, there's sometimes, you know, you might forget to bring them, but we're at least aware of the idea of them. But it, another related and frankly, more important um, use of reusables is in the packaging itself, not just the bags that we're using to transport all of the single use plastics. So, and some companies are moving toward that direction, you know, um, going toward the sort of old school delivery model um, where you send back your packaging. Um, so to, again, to me, that's another change that has to be made at, at sort of the corporate level, but, but we have influence in that. Abigail um, asked, is there a movement to tell retailers um, we will buy more from, from more ecological packagers? i.e. restaurants, grocery stores, and liquor stores. So that is one of the things we want to talk about when we get to the actions or next steps part. Right, and I'll make a real quick comment there, Steve. I do know that um, uh, there's a, a um, gosh, a group, um, a group, uh, sorry, uh, uh, an, a group named Sunrise um, that is a group of young, um, uh, young adults focused on uh, uh, environmental and economic issues, recognizing that solving problems, solving issues with both of those are not mutually exclusive. And uh, there's a chapter uh, uh, based in the Nutrier area. Uh, it's called Sunrise North Shore, and it was founded by uh, a, a handful uh, of two, two students, I think, but, uh, but it, 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 the group consists of a number of students at Nutrier High School. And they recently put out a survey uh, about re restaurants using single-use plastic, and we're asking specifically if knowing that a restaurant was choosing to use reusables um, or compostable or recyclable products instead of single-use disposable ones, would that make a difference in your choice? So there is some movement in that, and I think I, I think that will continue. But there is there is some. Okay. Oh, sorry, I jumped ahead. We have a couple more minutes on one. I apologize. Um, I, the last question, sort of the sub part of that was, do you think we have a plastic waste problem? Is that the problem? How about that? And while, uh, while we're thinking about that question, uh, Liz, I'll jump in with uh, sharing some more comments that we've gotten Great. quite a few. Of them. Let me just pick a couple out. Terry offered that. I don't think there's a big enough market out there uh, to recycle all the plastic that is produced. Just looking at the mountains of plastic in the movie, there's evidence that there's no way that there's a secondary market for all of that trash. I think that's, that's an excellent point and a point lightly touched on the movie, but uh, also important to consider is that the plastic recyclability breaks down over time. So there are a limited number of times you can use a plastic product as that same product. It, it has to be downcycled as uh, in, in future recycling and eventually thrown away. Very important uh, points. And as we've also mentioned, you've got this tremendous growth going on in terms of additional uh, capacity to produce more plastic. It's unlikely we're going to recycle our way out of this. So, um, uh, Lori offered that Collective Resources is having a contest right now to shop at retailers, especially food purveyors who use uh, who use Collective, I guess, uh, Collective Resources. Uh, if you buy $100 at the time, any, excuse me, if you buy $100 at any time, uh, at any of them and enter, you can win a gift card. So that's a little plug there for what they're doing for their part. Thanks, Lori. Janice mentioned too much single use. Absolutely. 40% of the plastic single use, and that's where a lot of this growth is also. What do we, what did we use before plastics? Michael says, and can we go back 
to some of those practices. Excellent point. I don't know how any if any of you remember Tupperware and Tupperware parties. That was a big deal in my house. I can remember the shift from uh, reusable glass containers to uh, to to that uh, initial plastic push. Beth, it's uh, uh, probably time to take a look at the second set of questions. I'll do that. All right. Again, we've we've been touching on this already now, but we'll do, do a little deeper dive into it. What do you think about the film's assertion that the the producers and petrochemical companies have actually promoted recycling as a way to actually increase their plastics production, while at the same time avoiding all responsibility for doing so, distracting and diverting attention from themselves, and keeping the burden and focus on individual consumers and municipalities for fixing the problem by recycling our way out of it. To me, that was one of the biggest, again, the, the thing that like strikes at my heart. <laughs> I feel taken advantage of for decades. <clears throat> uh, let me uh, add a couple, or speak some of the comments here. Um, Trudy asked, do we even know if our plastic is truly being recycled? Because I must wash out the bottles, does that, or, uh, does that negate some of the benefits? So both points are good ones. And I think um, since China's uh, ban on anything but pristinely cleaned recycling and only a few types, much of that has been gone going to other countries. And the movie, I thought, did a fabulous job of portraying what that means in villages in, in, uh, in Indonesia and in the Philippines and places where uh, these secondary markets have been found. And basically a lot of that unwanted plastic being dumped as trash into, uh, into the villages. So uh, I think that's a great question. And one that we need to have a better insight into. It, Steve, ahead, Steve may, I, may I jump in on, on a local issue? Um, I, I, something I've become aware of working in this space more the last couple years. So this, the movie touches on this, the, the wonderful, um, the man who, was, who started the recycling company who just sort of spoke the plain truth. I loved him. Um, and he talked about how the, and other people did about how the, the chasing arrows symbol, the number system that the company, the, the, producers put that symbol on the packaging to show that it can be recyclable, it's capable of being recycled, but it begs the question of whether there's a market for the item, the product, the end result. And that's why there's been such confusion around our country, all over our country about whether recycling works and, and does it work or not, because yet for years China took our recycling without much question but it is, I believe, causing sort of a reckoning in that. But real quick, in Illinois, there's some new standards coming out. Um, it's sort of working its way up to the state level. But basically, instead of looking at the chasing arrow number symbol, ignore that, because that's what the producers want you to look at. And that's not what, that's not the answer of whether it's recyclable. What answers whether it's recyclable is whether your hauler in your community takes it. And the, 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 the much narrower category of plastics specifically that are recyclable largely in our areas, you can define them according to their function or their shape, not the number. Think of it as tubs, jugs, jars, and bottles. Those are the four kinds of hard plastics that we can recycle safely in our area. Tubs, jugs, jars, bottles. That's it. If anything else, like the, a lot of the, again, it was as the man was pulling sort of samples of the plastic out of the bales in the warehouse saying this one has, you know, a little screen and it's got plastic film associated, all these. So finding pristine, uncontaminated plastic that's the same chemical composition such that somebody can turn it into something else is really, really hard. So think tubs, jugs, bottles, jars. That's what we need to look at. It's a much narrower universe than we ever thought of. I'll share a couple of comments here. Again, feel free to raise your hand and, and make a comment uh, to the group. Uh, just typing in the chat that you'd like to share something. Um, 
a discrepancy in expenditures on recycling versus production and uh, was huge. And I think the point there being production from new plastic, uh, virgin plastic. Um, or was that comment, uh, Patty, that the investment in recycling versus the investment in new production uh, capacity was a huge was hugely different. Maybe you could clarify for us. In some instances, there are competing biodegradable or compostable products as a replacement for plastics. How can we promote those? Uh, is there research in this area that might or should be subsidized? So I think those are great questions. We'll uh, we're actually going to talk about that when we get to the actions uh, and next steps section of this. And I will say again, I'll jump in and say, I know there is, there's movement, there are discussions happening about uh, the extent to which uh, sort of uh, plant-based plastic is really recyclable th to make sure there is no greenwashing to try to reduce the confusion. It's confusing now, but that's something that's being worked on in our state specifically to try to clarify uh, what is truly compostable versus recyclable versus what must go to landfill and why it's in the works. There's another question about uh, subsidies. And uh, Terry asked, in the, mo the movie talks about fossil fuel subsidies resulting in lower cost plastics. Does anyone know what type of fossil fuel subsidies in the US uh, are provided to oil and gas, the oil and gas industry? So no takeout food containers, the clear lids, for example, Beth? Correct. Exactly, yeah. they look like they should be totally recyclable, right? Again, I think the, the, the gentleman, I forget his name, I wanna say Kent, I don't know if that's right, but Kent who said, you know, this looks like it should be recyclable. How can you tell this kind of plastic from this kind of plastic? They look the same to you and me, but they're not. And so when you look at those plastic, that's the hard plastic, some's black, some's clear, it seems to me it's the same kind of consistency as a water bottle or any other bottle or again, or jug that I might have, but it's not. Mm -hmm. It's just not. So that's, yeah, tubs, jugs, bottles, jars. And again, the, the, the point over and over in the movie seems like it, we need to reinforce again. It's just the idea that there's, we can't recycle our way out of this problem. That's just not, that is not the solution. We're making too much of the stuff. We have to look at ways, other ways of doing business, a different kind of uh, economic cycle. Even if your waste hauler takes certain items, Janice wrote, uh, for recycling, it doesn't mean that the item will be recycled. And that was one of the, again, one of the points in the, the movie as they separated out those different types of plastic. Some of those bales were just sitting there and the man said, you can't find a market for this stuff. Uh, throwing away the tops and the plastic bottles and those little rings, I think those end up in rivers, et cetera and then sea creatures get stuck in them. Is that correct? And I think that, yes, what we, we saw reinforced in the movie is that you've got this tremendous amount of pollution coming out, coming out of nations around the world, but certainly uh, the preponderance of it coming out of about five countries in Asia. And uh, mostly because they don't have good infrastructure for managing the kind of waste that has been sent to them from the US and Europe and other developed countries uh, to them, essentially dumping our waste on their shores. And then it's getting washed into the oceans. Again, this is uh, Jeannie added, in some parts of the world, uh, they are converting trash into energy. The movie doesn't address this that much. That is true, it's particularly true in, in Europe and uh, in Germany in particular, in Europe. Uh, there, there's uh, a focus on trying to, to uh, take advantage of that. Uh, the petrochemical basis for plastic, I think the thing to keep in mind is that that's another burning of fossil fuels, right? And we're, we're, we're trying to reorient our economy away from burning fossil fuels because of the impact on the climate. So. While it may deal with the it be a potential solution for dealing with the plastic problem, it's just another way of burning fossil fuels, which is something we're trying to get away from. 
Go ahead. But I'll also say, Jeannie, hi, Jeannie. I, I think waste to energy is a really important, just like recycling is an important piece of the puzzle. It's just not the only piece. And it was, it's been inappropriate and sneaky and awful of the producers to, to give us the impression that that would be sufficient. But it's also not, I don't think it's a good idea to say it's not appropriate at all. We need to fix our systems. Um, and uh, similarly, Jeannie, I agree, we need to incorporate waste to energy as one of many solutions for dealing with our waste, but we need to make sure we're not creating more of a problem if we're releasing additional chemicals or emissions into the air, as again, one of the gentlemen said in the movie that, sure, you can burn it, but it's releasing a lot of toxic stuff into the air. So you need a whole other system to maybe try to manage th that those emissions um, that is still worth looking at, but it creates a whole other piece to, to, um, to deal with. So Liz, before you read the next question, I just want to note for everyone that Bill just posted a link to a site that, that speaks to uh, subsidies and uh, through some of the tax breaks, I think. How might we reimagine a future without single use plastics? What kind of policies and systems might we need to implement locally and beyond to help get us there? And then the last question is, can we quote, turn off the tap? And that quote is from the movie. Uh, one of the young activists, I believe, in the Philippines. I forgot, Philippines or Indonesia. Um, it, it, she's basically asking, can we stop our, our use of it in the first place? Can we turn off our desire for it? Um, as opposed to just, again, focus on the recycling. So again, that's this is the hard part. So can people imagine a future without single-use plastic? Again, what did we do before it? And now that we have it, how do we appropriately use it or not? So Lori jumped right in with one. She said, what about a deposit system that rewarded customers for taking cans, bottles, plastic containers back to the store for dollars? It's a really good question. And um, I, will have, I will have an update on that um, during our call to action session tonight. Great, I will too. I'll, I'll include some stuff at the state level on the, on the bottle bills. But yes, it's a great idea. I see somebody raising a hand. She has uh, fought the bottle return bills for decades. They work. Right. And, they, and uh, Lori also mentioned that they work in many states already. Uh, Illinois is slow on this. So that's uh, certainly an opportunity for discussion when we get to actions. Similar to that, are there laws uh, that require companies to take back all of their product packaging. Uh, though I don't know how you would trace a package back to its origin. That's a, that's a great question, Michael, and I think it's something worth, worth further conversation. So Patty it's, uh, it says that uh, we're in Kenya where no plastic bags are allowed. People were told or people told us the amount of garbage was dramatically reduced. What about a system that includes the cost of recycling and remediation in the cost of plastic? So remove that externality, that incentive to create waste and make sure that whoever was responsible remains responsible. I think it's a great point. Using bulk bins in grocery stores where people can buy food and use mason jars and other containers so they don't need to buy items in plastic wrapping, Jen offered. Um, Steve, I see a hand up, uh, Mary Monday. Okay, Mary. Um, one thing I remember when I was um, a child, uh, we, we didn't have things like strawberries in the winter. We, we had uh, turnips, I don't know, <laughs> whatever, but uh, bananas, I think we might have had bananas, but fruits, uh, we had citrus in the winter, but you didn't have all of the array of, of products that we now have become accustomed to because they get shipped across uh, the world. And we're accustomed to having everything that we want to have in every season. And I think that without plastics, 
I mean, I, I had asked my question earlier, how do you buy blueberries? I meant, how do you buy blueberries in the winter if they're not encased in something? There would be so much. So, so that, that's an issue. And also um, earlier, I, I, I believe that, that sanitation is a big issue for bringing your own jars mm -hmm. and containers into stores, because then if you take something home and it is uh, contaminated in some way, if it wasn't in a, a proper, in, in a container that they have control over, then liability becomes a big issue for the, for the retailer. It, it just, it's very complex, this issue. Of, I, I love the idea of buying in bulk, but I don't think retailers are too happy about that for liability purposes. So I'll be quiet. No, it's great. It's it's they are not there aren't simple solutions, right? That's a great point, Mary. And it, and it's hard to give up conveniences you've become accustomed to, and so that's going to be a challenge, right? Uh, disposable diapers, uh, Janice offered. I <laughs> I miss my tidy wash. Is that what a tidy wash? I, or, when I was a mother, I had great, great uh, pick diaper washed and brought back. Uh, it, and it doesn't exist anymore. Yep. Uh, I wonder I what there are. Few, there are a few diaper services, but they are few and far between for yeah, sure. Right. It takes a special uh, person in this day and age to use those. Mm hmm. Uh, Jeannie mentioned that she wondered what percentage of the plastic waste. Uh, that is from healthcare, and is that all incinerated for safety's sake? I don't know the right. answer to that, Beth. I think it usually is. Almost everything that is 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 that has that healthcare could be contaminated in some way is sadly incinerated. It's a big issue. And Jeannie, I know I what was the, there was the movie we we screened a couple years ago where I forget the name of it. Jeannie, you'll remember it. Put it in the chat if you can. I, it was a, yeah. a young what say it again? A clean bin project? Clean bin project. Yeah. So yeah, good. thanks Steve. <laughs> Right, it's so good. So it's a young couple that um, yes. competed against each other to see who could produce the least amount of waste over the course of a year. And the husband was definitely sort of prone to kind of push the envelope anyway. He sort of justified some decisions, but actually what cost him, what ultimately cost him the competition was an injury he suffered because he ended up with medical waste. Remember that Jeannie, it overflowed the bin that? because he couldn't oh. get rid of it. Uh huh. Oh, and I'll also remember, I'm sorry, but her, the whole, the, the, the bulk of his wife's waste who went so far as to like make her own toothpaste as part of this competition, she was all in, by the way, they didn't have kids. <laughs> it was easier for them to do this, but she also, honestly, the bulk of her waste was the packaging from birth control pills. That was oh, almost her entire right. waste for the year. That was that's it. And his was the medical, he had the, he had like a neck brace and an yeah. arm. It, Good memory. Yeah. So yeah, I think that, but I think the medical waste is a real issue, yeah. it's a huge issue. Especially now. I don't know, I don't know how you, exactly, I don't know how you get past that safety aspect of it. Yeah. Ugh. Mary's, to Thanks, Mary's Jeannie. concern about uh, um, blueberries in plastic containers, uh, Susan offered that fruit used to come in pressed paper containers. So maybe there's oh, right. some sort there. Some of them do, like in farmers markets, right? Farmers markets and produce stands, you're more likely to find those cardboard containers still. Molly <laughs> offer, or asked this question, what if producers were made uh, by law responsible for the end of life uh, of the products that they're making, internalizing versus externalizing the cost? Things would change quickly, she hypothesizes. Um, but I'm not sure that the lobbyists would go, uh, would be all for it. <laughs> yes, great point. But that, that really, it really comes down to who's bearing the cost. And right now we can see it, it's the planet. Janice, you had, uh, I see. Yeah, I, um, when you were talking about the medical waste, I am, I just started a new drug and it comes in so much packaging. You can't pick it up from a pharmacy and it comes in a huge box, a styrofoam case, all these plastic cooling cases, um, multiple boxes inside and a throw in a, 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 not a renews, uh, reusable injectable. It's a shot every single time. 
and the amount of waste is driving me crazy. It's been five months and I cannot figure this out because before I used to take shots, they had an, a, a reusable auto inject and now auto, all the auto injects are throwaways. So it's even more waste and it has to stay cold. And I'm just, I'm flabbergasted on how much for one little shot. Wow. Janice, may I jump in again? I, I needless to say, I share that frustration. And anytime I get something, I, either on a medical side, there was one time I ordered a necklace that was not even breakable. And it literally came in six separate layers of plastic packaging from Amazon. It was obscene. And I took pictures, it came from like Banana Republic. And I took pictures of the layers of packaging and said, why? It's a cloth yeah. necklace. Um, but so I, I honestly, I recommend emailing them like contacting them and saying oh, why is I this called, necessary I contact i wrote an email it was driving me insane i took pictures and i and i oh. said can you just can i get and deliver to the target cvs just right you know get a bunch shipped there and have them store it so i could just pick one up do 10 at a time and i'll just pick them up oh. there thank and you no nothing don't That's give my up. two cents. Sorry. <laughs> Don't give up. There is in the chat some conversation about frozen products and the plastic wrap packaging that they come in, the film, if you will. Uh, so not quite as bulky or, uh, um, you know, much plastic is used in some of these fresh packaging solutions, but still, still a single use plastic. Uh, and the question about how are, are those able to be recycled? And I think, you know, Liz, you know a lot about that. You might want to, want to comment on film, film plastic recycling. The film plastic is, again, a separate category of plastics. Um, one of the things that's important to note that the, the, the movie doesn't really get into because it's, it's obviously trying to move the focus away from recycling. But to the extent recycling is an option for um, at least keeping some items out of landfill and reusing them in some capacity, you know, the fi plastic film is recyclable. Again, it's just there is and there is a market for it. It's just that the channel through which it's collected is not our sort of traditional recycling or curbside recycling where our hard plastics are recycled. Um, the plastic film it typically is taken by grocery stores. Um, they, again, they use it as the raw, the, the raw material to create their plastic bags. Um, but the, there's, it, I'm, I was pleasantly surprised by the range of plastics that is ultimately recyclable because again, they, they, at, at, for, for lay people, they don't look like they're the same type of plastic or the same composition, but they are. Um, but they're the kinds of things that need to go to, again, to go to the grocery store rather than in a curbside bin. Um, typically the way those work with the grocery stores is, um, grocery stores partner often, most often that I know of with a company named Trex, T-R-E-X, which uses plastic bags as its, uh, feedstock for creating alternate wood products, decks, planks. So uh, my recollection is 2000 plastic grocery bags can get turned into one two by four by 16 foot long plank that then becomes decking and chairs and tables and things like that. So Trex runs contests through our schools each year to um, educate and create awareness about the recyclability of those kinds of plastic films and bags. Um, and that contest is happening this year. It's just obviously has lower participation because of the vagaries of in school, uh, sorry, in-person school this year. But um, there are a lot of those collection bins around Winnetka also, uh, again, a little bit kind of a little bit lighter right now than usual because of the virus. But in general, that's uh, an effort that our schools, the community house has one, the libraries had one in the past, um, and there are collection bins for those kinds of film with list a comprehensive list of what kind of film can be uh, recycled through that program. So Susan asked, does that include uh, frozen food bags? The the, okay, sorry. The baseline. One of the reasons the plastic film is so hard to recycle is because. Um, so like hard plastics, you can recycle them if they have some liquid in them, you don't want it to be, you know, sticky, but it could be wet with water that wouldn't, that's not considered contamination, but water in plastic film is contamination. Any sort of crumbs in plastic film is contamination. So the problem with the plastic film or bags that has been used specifically in contact with food is whether there's any sort of residue left behind. And if there is, can it be wiped off? Can it be brushed off? 
Um, if it's greasy, you know, probably not. So the frozen food, I think you could probably, but you might, there's a little bit more labor to really try to make sure there's no moisture, you know, no, um, no ice left, no peas left in the bag and just make sure the bag is truly clean. It needs to be clean and dry. Mm -hmm. So that gets harder to do whenever it's been in touch with food to begin with. But thank you for asking that. That's a great, great point. I, I like to cut mine, rinse mine and dry it. And then, you know, you can right. wrap it. I'll, I'll do I, on one of the, the cereal bags cereal if you if you if people eat dry cereal I have teenagers so we have some cereal in our house the, the the plastic bags that are the inserts to cereal boxes those actually are recyclable and again that's a perfect example of the kind of plastic film or bag that I wouldn't think is the same as a Ziploc bag or a newspaper sleeve or a dry cleaning bag but it is and if you, you like as Steve just said to sort of separate it what's you take the that that those plastic inserts are actually a rectangle and you can rip that you you open one seam and you open the other seam and it turns into one basically 11 by 18 strip of plastic that you can brush the brush the dust from the cereal off and absolutely recycle it very easily the dry crumbs are easier to get rid of and when you can flatten and you don't have to deal with corners then that obviously makes it doable and it's a it's as my kids say it's very satisfying so um Abigail mentioned that in Chicago, the grocery stores seem to have stopped accepting plastic film. Are you aware of that? Well, so in Chicago, and I believe in Evanston, they've had a plastic bag ban. So it is a different situation than in many of our villages in, in the area. We do not have bans where most of us live, but um, the, the ban in Illinois, or sorry, in, in Chicago and, and Evanston it's not a complete ban, um, but it, they're basically, I, and I don't know the details, so I don't, I don't want to misstate it. And if anybody knows the specifics, please chime in. But um, basically, there's a tax that's charged um, if you want to use a plastic bag in certain grocers and retailers um, of a certain size above a certain square footage are prohibited from using certain bags and things like that. So it's definitely had an effect. Um, but I remember one of the effects was that it, I think one of the gosh, one of the metrics was sort of the thickness of the bag. And so one of the responses was for retailers to start using thicker bags. It basically exempted them from the requirement and it still meant that they were using plastic and even worse plastic bags than they might otherwise. Mm -hmm. But I do believe in the city in Evanston that, that that has changed the situation a bit. So Liz, as we get ready to move on to talking about um, actions that we could take, I'll share one more comment here from Jill. Uh, she mentioned that uh, a, a company, Dispatch Goods, developed a successful reusable takeout food container system for San Francisco, and that they're exploring the Chicago market. Thank uh, you. And that there is a, a list, I guess, of restaurants. Yeah, there's a webinar happening tomorrow night at, um, at I believe it's 5.30 in the afternoon. Um, Dispatch is involved, and maybe the shed. I, I, I'm, I, I've heard it from, from a lot of different sources, but I recall tomorrow fi at 5:30, there's a, a webinar specifically on restaurant uh, use of plastics and to-go containers. Sorry, to-go containers and utensils and things like that. So thank you for mentioning that. For uh, participating restaurants, it'll be helpful. Right. Okay. All right, so the rest of our discussion tonight is gonna to focus on what we're calling calls to action. Uh, this is something that actually the, the, uh, the story of plastic producers ask us to do um, so that people sort of walk away with a specific uh, action item or to do. So we've organized ours into personal or individual actions you can take, uh, group collective actions you can take. Each of those we'll spend about five minutes on. And then the last one, about 15 minutes, we'll talk about citizenship or advocacy and contacting elected officials, using your voice um, to, to effectuate change. And both Jeffrey and I will, will talk about some legislation um, at the state and national level in that regard. So um, uh, this slide is, is, is intended to show ways, resources that are available uh, to, to make some personal changes. Um, on the right-hand side of the screen is the Shed Aquarium Action Guide that was recently released as part of its less, uh, sorry, Let's uh, Shed Plastic Initiative. Um, and as you can see, it has some steps 
that you can take and it, it actually gives you the opportunity to make a pledge to, to specifically reduce one, you know, your use of one type of, of single use disposable plastic like straws, bottles, coffee cups, utensils, bags, takeout containers, et cetera. Um, I also included a few other resources on this page um, and I've got some physical uh, real world examples um, of things that I've started doing um, to reduce my use of plastic. Um, on the left, bottom left of the screen, um, it is, are these true earth laundry strips. They come in a, pla in a cardboard container and they are concentrated strips of laundry soap. They do arrive from Canada. They are not in our country, but there's no plastic at all. And these strips, you just rip them up and you put them in your dispenser, just like you would a liquid. And all of the clothes come out smelling lovely and clean. And I love it. I, they come once a month. You can get them with whatever frequency you want. True earth. Um, laundry strips, sorry. Uh, in the center of the screen are some wooden utensils. Um, many people have heard of bamboo utensils, which I like a lot. The ones that are shown in the image and the ones that I have here in my hands, they are, I forget what kind of wood they are, I apologize, but they're really like popsicle sticks. And so they are, they're lighter weight. They they, they, they can remind you of your childhood. Like they're just wonderful. Um, and they're much, I find them easier to use than, than the bamboo um, service wear, which can be kind of bulky. Um, these, the ones that I have are by a company called Wood U. <laughs> and they come in these cool cylindrical containers, one for forks, one for knives, one for spoons. So I started using them because I do a lot of um, events and obviously wanted to move away from the single use items for that. Um, a couple other fun examples. I love these, people may have seen these. They're these Swedish dishcloths. I've seen a lot more of them. Um, these came from the second company listed called Free the Ocean. Um, Free the Ocean is a nonprofit that does work on um, ocean pollution and, and restoration and conservation. Um, and Free the Ocean, I like because they, they don't just have products that you can use to make a difference, um, but you can sign up for their um, email list. It's just freetheocean.com. And um, if you sign up for their mailing list every morning when you wake up, you'll have an email from them with a trivia question about the ocean. Some of it's about marine life, some of it's about pollution, some of it's historical. And if you answer that question, whether you get it right or wrong, you're funding the removal of one piece of plastic from the ocean. So I've been having a ridiculously good time with this for the last few months. And you can click through and find some amazing sort of you know, National Geographic type images that really show some amazing um, scenes of our ocean life. So Free the Ocean has that. And then they are one of many companies that sell these Swedish dishcloths. These are made from wood cellulose and paper. So they dry hard because they're wood, but when they get wet, they soften. And so they're basically a good replacement for an, a lightweight sponge. You can't really scrub with them too well, but in, in lieu of a dishcloth, in lieu of a sponge, if you just wanna wipe up a spill, they're absorbent, they're reusable. And at the end of the life of their lives, they're compostable. So there are those. And then the one other item I got from Free the Ocean recently are these, um, another scrubbing device, they're coconut scrubbers. Um, and so these work where those don't. Um, and they work really well. And they also, I mean, they're, they're just made of coconut fiber. They come in packs of three or four. Um, I've had been using one for a couple of months. This is the package it comes in. And I used one for a couple of months and it's just now falling apart after a lot of scrubbing uses. So there are a lot of companies that can help at least try to move away from plastic. And obviously at base, we wanna try to consume less in the first place, right? Keep it in the ground. Um, so there are some companies that I do believe have the right idea at heart to try to make it easier. So these are some solutions I've had I wanted to share. I like them a lot, um, but I'm sure that other people have lots of ideas also for solutions or questions also. Uh, Carolyn offered that Earth Hero has a lot of products like the ones that you talked about. So Great. Thank you. And okay. uh, Rose included a link called the Loop Store. Uh, is a program for consumers seeking to reduce their waste. It's another good resource. Great. So I think we'll go on to the group one now. Mm -hmm. Right. Great. So, oh, sorry. 
I did not, I did not do that. I did not do that. <laughs> Sorry, calls to action on the public group or collective side. Um, again, in line with the initiative, the Let's Shed Plastic initiative by the Shed Aquarium, it, that program really focuses on cleanup events, beach cleanups, river cleanups, park cleanups. And our Go Green Winneka group has, has focused on those too. It's, it's kind of a, a bread and butter activity for our local Go Green groups. Uh, Go Green Will Met has been doing amazing beach cleanups in Gilson Beach for the last few years. Um, they evolve with the times. Um, we did this one, the, the pictures in this on this slide. All right. So anyway, in terms of, of, of collective and group activities, we, we uh, um, encourage everybody to, to join a group, create a group where you are, join a, I'm uh, sorry, I misspoke, join a cleanup event, join a one-off event if you want. There are many sponsored by the Shed Aquarium. Um, the, um, and again, if you go to the website, the, um, the Shed Aquarium website, they have information about their Let's Shed Plastic Initiative, um, including some some uh, cleanup events specifically. Uh, if you're, you know, in 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 areas uh, that that make it easy for that, sorry, easy for you to take advantage of those. Um, the FCR acronym next to Shed is the Friends of the Chicago River. They also do a lot of water-based conservation cleanup events, um, and then uh, GGW. It, Go Green Winneka, it's also Go Green Wilmette. Again, a lot of our local Go Green groups host cleanup events at beaches. Um, in Winneka, we're looking at doing them in some of the park areas along the Green Bay Trail as the weather gets nicer. Um, and so we welcome everybody to join those events. Um, and then similarly, and maybe a, a step up would be joining or creating a, a group that is going to move these initiatives forward in connection with your community or your school or your business or another organization that you're involved with. Um, you know, basically, Steve and I are here because I don't know how many, six years ago, Steve said, will you come start our work with me on our Winneka Congregational Church Green Team? <laughs> and, and, and here we are. And now Steve's with Go Green Winneka and, and we have just a really robust you know dialogue and 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 groups working on these issues so it's and and beth drucker at go green will met this is what this is beth's passion is getting these kinds of groups going at the community level so if you're on this call on this zoom and you're in a community that doesn't have a citizens group that's focused on environmental issues email me i'll put you in touch with beth this is this is her jam this is what we do is to get these kinds of conversations going in communities um, where they're not happening already and making it easy for people to, to do that and find like-minded people who can help move things along so that you don't feel like you're doing it all by yourself and you're not reinventing the wheel. Liz, um, may, I, may I add something there? If folks, yes. um, another way you can help in groups is if you belong to a group that's not a green group, like a homeowners association or anything, you can be a gentle but persistent voice to help them adopt um, more uh, plastic-free practices for their social events. Thank you, Jeffrey. That's what I meant to be saying, and it probably wasn't clear, but the last bullet point where it's green team for, you can sort of, within another organization that doesn't have an environmental focus, you can help create a, a little bit of awareness on that front. Um, so uh, come join us. All right, now we'll go to the last slide. Sorry, I apologize and keep going the wrong way. The calls to action on the advocacy or citizenship side. Um, I, I like this idea very much. It's sort of going beyond what change you can do yourself in your home, even in your community, but what, what extra step can you take? Um, and so we're, we're, we'll focus a little bit on sort of two, two bills that have been, uh, were previously introduced and, and Jeffrey's gonna give the status of one at the federal level. And then I will talk a little bit about one at the state level. So okay. Jeffrey. Thanks Liz. Um, you see on the screen, uh, the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. Um, those numbers do not apply because those numbers happen to be the numbers for the last Congress. At the end of each Congress, uh, legislation that has not moved um, does not exist anymore. It needs to be reintroduced in the new Congress. So the new, new Congress started January 3rd and the principal sponsor of Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act was Representative Alan Lowenthal, a Democrat from California. 
I called his office yesterday and the staffer I talked to there said, uh, Representative Lowenthal will reintroduce the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act in this new Congress, but he has not done so yet. So be looking for that, but not by those numbers you see on your screen. Um, Senator Durbin was one of the 10 principal Senate co-sponsors of the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act in the last Congress. And there were a couple of dozen other representatives, uh, House members who were uh, principal sponsors with Representative Lowenthal. So be looking for that one. What does it do? Um, you can actually find the details of this bill by going to the Surf Rider Foundation. I'm gonna put that in the, the uh, chat here. The Surf Rider Foundation is the surfer's lobby. Everybody's got a lobby. I think ministers should have a lobby. The Surf Riders Foundation, their website has an excellent description of the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. Let me share just a couple of bullet points about this act. It would require producers of packaging containers and food service products to design, um, manage, and finance waste and recycling programs. So the producers would have to fund the recycling system. It would create a nationwide beverage container refund program, nationwide. It would ban certain single-use plastic products that are not recyclable. It would ban single-use plastic carryout bags. It would prohibit plastic waste from being shipped to developing countries. The United States would have to take care of its own plastic waste. I was gonna say something else. But. Place a temporary pause on new plastic facilities until the EPA updates and creates important regulations on those facilities. And this is a massive bill with big implications. So watch for that one. Um, I want to put in the chat here some other um, national websites. One is called plasticfreepresident.org. This is a national effort to get President Biden to become the first president to commit to a plastic-free future. Um, that man has a lot on his plate right now, of course, but getting plastic pollution before this new administration will take a public campaign and we can all be part of that. Um, there's some other ones, plasticpollutioncoalition.org. Um, so that's for the national level. Uh, Liz, did you want to talk about the styrofoam bill at the state level? Sure. So I was curious, I had, uh, like Jeffrey, we, we had talked about the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act at the federal level, and I was curious what, if anything, was happening at the state level. So I'll, I'll tell you all, if you're curious, literally, I did a Google search, like Plastics Legislation Illinois. And what I came up with was similar to what Jeffrey said, um, a bill that was introduced at the last session in 2020. Um, ironically, the timing was such for both the national and the state bills that they were introduced in February of 2020, and then obviously went nowhere as most legislation did last year for obvious reasons. So um, I, the, um, the, uh, the, the uh, state senator in Illinois who introduced the bill that's referred to here, and again, the, the number is irrelevant, but the, um, the substance of the ban is that it would uh, ban polystyrene styrofoam uh, containers from, uh, as, to, as takeout containers from restaurants. And then there is a bottle bill or bottle deposit bill as part of it. For what it's worth, I believe, my understanding is the issue of a bottle bill or deposit bill sorry, bottle deposit bill in Illinois is actually introduced literally every year. And it's shot down so quickly by the lobbyists that most of, most of us don't even hear about it, honestly. I've asked a couple times and that's what I've been told. So, so this is another iteration of it. Luckily, the state senator who introduced it is our state senator for Winnetka and our district. It's Senator Laura Fine, who's based in Glen, uh, Glenview, I apologize. And um, I, I, I have met her through our Go Green groups, actually. Um, and 
she, so I, I emailed her a couple of days ago and asked what the status of the bill was. And she said, again, as Jeffrey said, it died uh, at the end of the last session because nothing happened on it, but she is planning to reintroduce it this month uh, in this session. And she's not sure, but she said she believes potentially there may be other bills, uh, sort of related bills being introduced. Uh, she just doesn't know uh, specifically about them, but if those, to the extent those happen, that will also be in the next couple of weeks. Um, so hopefully we will hear sooner rather than later if there's some other um, initiatives at the state level. And Liz, I just found out more information about this today from the Illinois Environmental Council. Uh, their clean, clean Water Policy Director, Iana Simba, reports that the uh, House sponsor for the styrofoam ban bill is Representative Gong Gershowitz, who I think okay. is also local to the North Shore, right? I agree, yes. And uh, Iana Simba also told me that the, um, uh, the bill to institute a deposit for bottles, cans, and um, uh, beverages will be introduced in this session as a separate bill by Representative Great. Delia Ramirez. Awesome, thank you. So, um, and I would also note that I called my own state rep about these things yesterday and she knows me. She takes my calls, answers my emails and this isn't about me or her, it, but the general point is we can all build a personal relationship with our state senators and state reps because they are much closer to the people than members of Congress are just because there are so, uh, they, they represent fewer people. And if you build a relationship with your state rep now, you can use that relationship, leverage it in the future for all kinds of issues you might be interested in, but they need to know who you are, that you're friendly, that you, um, that you wanna work together with them. And a lot of things can happen through citizen action, if you know personally your state rep and state senator. That's an excellent point, Jeffrey, and a wonderful segue. So our next slide is about making your voices heard and, and specifically facilitating contacting your representative. Obviously, this screen is somewhat Winneka specific, um, but it may be relevant to other people you know, in our immediate, uh, in our neighboring communities. Um, uh, the first section, sorry, I have to move my screen. Um, in terms of local, I didn't limit it to Winnetka. Obviously, the message is you can communicate with your local governing bodies, the, the commercial entities in your community, the other organizations in your community, and, and, and make it known that this is a priority for you. You can email, you can start a petition, you can go to a public meeting. Um, in Winnetka, our village council has made it relatively easy to communicate with the council. There's one email address that you can use and, and any message you send gets distributed and shared with all of our council members. Um, so uh, not, again, not every place is that easy, but you can communicate with your elected officials um, and, and, uh, and private officials too, again, and just make your, make your voice heard. And then again, these are the, this is the contact information for our state, uh, state representative, Robin Gable, who's based in Evanston, uh, and is by the way, a huge environmental proponent. She has, um, I think she typically gets a hundred percent approval rating from the Illinois Environmental Council each year. She uh, sponsors and introduces a number of environmentally focused uh, uh, bills each year. Um, and then again, State Senator Fine, uh, also a friend of, of environmental issues. Um, and then on the federal level, uh, U.S. Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky and our two federal U.S. Senators, uh, Tammy Duckworth and, and, and Dick Durbin. Um, and um, I'll reiterate and, and echo what Jeffrey said, uh, but I'll also say, don't feel like you have, I mean, it's great to have a personal relationship, but they will listen to you even if you don't. You can call them and, and leave a message and say, I'm a constituent and I care. Um, and, and what do you, what's your take on this? And they will respond. Um, so, and then obviously there's that much more benefit if you can develop a personal relationship because again, I, you can do something like I did and say, thank you, Senator Fine. Can you let me know the status of this bill for this amazing presentation we're doing tonight? So I can share the information with all of these people who wanna know more about it. So don't be shy about that. Um, okay, shall we go to the last one? 
close enough. Sorry, Steve, I think you're muted. Thank you. Uh, Sorry, there's some comments. Yeah, before you go, I just wanted to note that Rose shared that the Illinois Environmental Council and the Illinois chapter of the Sierra Club are also great resources for learning about environmental legislation in Illinois. Thank you very much. So, and obviously for people who are more interested, almost all of these organizations have newsletters, mailing lists, you know, you get on them and you can be kept apprised of legislation or issues that they're working on. Um, and and uh, Liz, Gloria included a link to something that uh, a, a meeting tomorrow, uh, I believe the title is Moving Beyond Plastics. Uh, restaurant. That's the restaurant one that I mentioned that yeah. the that the dispatch group is a part of. That's what it's called, Moving Beyond Plastics. But I believe it's focused on the ref restaurant industry. And she included a link here for us. Great. Yeah, I think I, restaurants are a big one, obviously. That's a, it's a big issue. And again, in, in the um, in the context of, of a virus and, and one that we are still learning about and didn't know much, you know, knew even less about months ago. It's understandable that there would be concerns about um, reusables and, um, and, and, and uh, feeling a comfort with disposable items. And I think that, and that's okay too, by the way, there's no judgment with anybody. I, I was comfortable using my single use plastic bags for a little while in the spring myself. I didn't really like it, but I was like, that's a, it's a choice we have to make. But what I'm not okay with is the plastics industry leveraging this and saying, oh, we need this much more and here's why. I'm not okay with that. But there's no judgment about the comfort level that people have you know, to, to just live their lives. But it's just that there can be some other alternatives um, uh, if you if you just kind of shift things a little bit. So, all right. So here's a nice little timeline. I, I, I know the text is a little small, but hopefully it's okay on your screens. Um, I, um, I know many of you have seen this throwaway living cover from Life Magazine in 1955. Um, I saw it relatively recently, a few years ago, and it was after I was involved in, this, in these initiatives and waste reduction initiatives specifically. So I remember when I first saw that cover in the last maybe five years or so, it, it physically sickens me <laughs> to see it, to see this thrown up in the air like confetti, uh, you know, and to think about what those pieces in those pictures, in that picture, are doing still sitting in the landfill somewhere, <laughs> you know? Um, and then in the 70s and 80s, as we talked about, um, in, in part as, as, a, as a way to deflect criticism um, of, of the damage and threat to uh, the environment from this plastic production and, and waste and pollution, uh, the beverage, pack, pack, uh, sorry, beverage uh, and packaging companies shifted attention to these municipal taxpayer funded recycling programs. Um, and then again, as we discussed in 2018, things shifted very significantly when China went offline and banned the import of other plastics and, uh, and materials. The world immediately lost 50% of the recycling capacity that had previously been available when, when China shut that down. So it, it was striking. Um, and then where we are now in 2021, as, as the movie showed and as we've talked about tonight, the oil and gas industry recognizes uh, that 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 uh, their that their production is not going to be needed to fuel our cars as much, um, and they're doubling down on the production of single-use plastics. Uh, in the meantime, uh, and Beth alluded to this early on in the discussion. Uh, the movie says 325 new or expanded facilities for plastics production are online in the U.S. in the next four years. At this point, four years. So um, we have our work cut out for us. So, and then uh, Jeffrey found this amazing advertisement, this commercial that the American Beverage Association just put out. Um, I had trouble screen sharing it from my screen. So I'm gonna stop sharing and Jeffrey's gonna jump in and share his screen so that we all can see this just 30 second short. So I saw this commercial uh, two consecutive evenings on the NBC National News. So that tells me that the uh, beverage industry is gearing up probably in my guess estimation to get ahead of any national anti-plastic legislation such as the Break Free from Plastic Act. This is my suspicion. Environment. That's why at America's beverage companies, our bottles are made to be remade. Not all plastic is the same. 
We're carefully designing our bottles to be 100% recyclable, including the caps. They're collected and separated from other plastics. So they can be turned back into material that we use to make new bottles. That completes the circle and reduces plastic waste. Please help us get every bottle back. The truth is what the Redditors did here. <laughs> we need to reduce plastic waste in the environment. That's why at America's Beverage Company, up. So this came up, everybody just, you know, in one of our, our last planning meetings, the last couple of days, as Jeffrey said, he, he saw this video and thought it was, we thought it was an appropriate coda to this discussion. Um, and, and sort of, again, open it up a little bit, we're winding up, but I, I'm curious what people's takes are on that, because actually there's a little bit of, of disagreement within even our three co-hosts for tonight on sort of, on, on sort of what to, how to interpret that, um, that advertisement. So if anybody has comments on that, I can't see it when I'm sharing my screen. So if there are any comments, please let me know. Terry suggested, Liz, that um, if the American Beverage Association wants to get their bottles back, that we mail all of our bottles back to them. I think that's fabulous. I noticed that the, the, the woman, I think the woman who said the last thing she says is help us get our bottles back, mm -hmm. right? So the, 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 it's still on us. It's still telling us what we can do to make a difference. And it's saying they're, you know, they're taking some steps, but I, I would question again, how much of the investment are they putting to recycling facilities or or not even recycling facilities, but as opposed to new facilities to to uh, produce plastic, you know, what's the ratio? Um, it's probably much less that they're putting on the recycling and capture side. Um, but I will note, I looked at, I looked this up uh, yesterday because I was curious about it. And the, the American Beverage Association is partnering with two recognized and renowned environmental organizations, which are the World Wildlife Fund and the Closed Loop Partners. And so I, I say at least with, um, uh, while I'm skeptical about the commercial, I have to think they're, there's some, there's something different that they're doing. It's not just the same old, same old, because I don't think World Wildlife Fund and Closed Loop Partners would be involved if there weren't something slightly different. That's my take, but I don't want to get sucked in either because clearly I've been duped before. And as we've discussed, Liz, the main point for everyone is that as we just left a page talking about what we can do collectively as citizens in sponsoring legislation, we have to recognize that this isn't the first time around for the, the industry and they're gonna fight it hard and their dollars are gonna go into swaying public opinion about why it's okay to continue to consume all the plastic that they wanna produce. And that's the cycle we must break. That's a perfect conclusion, Steve. What Steve said. Yeah, I thank you all for being a part of this uh, circle of concern and conversation and mutual support and learning tonight. Uh, especially thank uh, Liz Kunkel and uh, Steve Hules for facilitating and preparing all that they did. Um, keep, uh, let's keep coming together from time to time so that we can continue to get to know one another build a movement here on the North Shore among friends who are really trying to make a, a different difference in every level, that individual, group, and citizen level. Liz, Steve, any concluding words from you? Just thanks everybody for your participation. And yeah, thank uh, you everybody. Go to the Winneka Congregational Church YouTube channel and you can see in a few days um, uh, this video will be there, a video of this, the re this recording tonight.